Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to open the conference today, uh, this conference on Ukraine, Europe and differentiated integration, which also is the final uh, event of our DICE project. So first of all, let me thank warmly uh, Birgit Laffan, John Eric Postum and also Lorenzo Cicchi for the collaboration on this but also uh, overall on the um, uh, implementation of our joint project, which was very rewarding. Um, this first session is devoted to security. You have already started uh, this conversation yesterday evening. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here with you. Uh, but the, the objective of the conference uh, today is really to take stock of the many um, impacts that the war in Ukraine has produced on the European Union and to understand why, um, how uh, fundamental aspects and assumptions um, of the European contract have been redefined, starting in particular with the military and security dimension. Today we have a, a great panel with us. Uh, we will start with uh, Alex Tube. I don't think I need to introduce him, but he's the current director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. Uh, then Maria Giulia Amadio Vicere, uh, who is currently Marie Curie Fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. And Josef Batora, who is a, a professor at Webster Vienna Private University and Cornelius University in Bratislava. So, um, I mean, we have witnessed already a number of consequences of the Russian aggression to Ukraine on the um, governance of the European Union. In terms of the specific sector we are addressing in this first session, security and defense, we have uh, um, observed a strategic convergence on uh, main objectives uh, within the European Union, which has been also epitomized by the use of the European Peace Facility and for the first time for, um, with granting uh, uh, military support to the Ukrainian government. However, there are a number of cleavages that remain in terms of the path to follow, and we have, been, we have seen this also in the uh, posture of the uh, Nordic and Eastern European countries towards NATO compared to other countries in the European Union, and also some national recipes which we don't know exactly how will fit in the European dimension, starting with the decision uh, by unprecedented by Germany to allocate uh, 100 billion euros to uh, defense investment. And then there is also the external dimension of uh, security and defense, which requires a reflection on the side of the European Union, what kind of future security architecture would like to build in the European continent and what kind of partnerships the European Union will have to build with partners and neighbors, especially in terms of security guarantees. And it is with this last aspect that, that we'd like to uh, ask Alex to, to uh, jump in in the conversation uh, to let us know what are, in his view, uh, the trajectories the European Union should follow in terms of building the future of the European uh, security setup. So, Alex, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. 10 minutes, that's an excessively long time for a Finn sitting here in the middle of the snow. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation uh, and uh, congratulations, I think, on the whole project and, and nice to see all of you almost virtually. I even caught Bridget Laffan there earlier. Uh, let me just make some initial remarks on, on, on how I, I see the situation and how I would like to frame it. Um, I think from a European perspective, uh, and especially with the big idea of the European security architecture, this is one of those sort of 1945 or 1975 or 1991 moments. Uh, in other words, a moment when the whole security structure of, of Europe uh, will take one direction or another. 
1945, it ended up in a bipolar world uh, with the Soviet Union and the United States with Europe as an ally, uh, providing a certain security structure. In 1975, we tried to make it collective with the Helsinki Accords and the European Organization for Security and Cooperation in, or in, in Europe. Uh, and of course, in 1991, I think the uh, solutions of a European stru security structure that we sought were very much of, of engagement and integration and absorption of Eastern and Western Europe. So my, my, my first observation is to say that really at the end of the day, what we have seen since the 24th of February de facto is the remolding of a European uh, security structure. Second point, um, I think uh, the idea of a European political, of European political cooperation, I guess originally um, outlined uh, by President Emmanuel Macron is part of a solution that I think is worth um, examining. Uh, and I know this sounds a little bit politically correct and careful, but for me, the situation is the following. Russia will be isolated for the foreseeable future. That means isolation financially, economically, uh, politically, sports, culture, uh, energy, transport, travel. So I think the base case that we have to start with it, that on, on one side, of a new iron curtain or whatever you want to call it, is an isolated Russia until it is able to sort itself out. On the other side, you have 44 European states. And remember that 44 is almost a quarter of the world's nation states. So when we see uh, a meeting in Prague uh, on specific issues such as climate and security, with 44 states. And when we see Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, around the same table with the president of France discussing the future of Europe in a broad sense, then we have to understand that something bigger is, 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 is happening. And here is of course where the European political uh, community uh, and the new European security structure comes in. My third point is, I, I wrote a piece for the uh, European Council for Foreign Relations, their, their homepage, uh, about uh, you know, the case for a confederal Europe. I, I know it's always a little bit dangerous to use these terms, but perhaps it should be the case for a European political community. And the way in which I see it is that basically we have three categories of states in the European uh, security structure, especially from an EU perspective. Uh, the first one is the 27 EU member states. Uh, the second one is what I, so that's the EU proper. The second one is something that could be called European community. And those are the countries that want to join the European Union, but uh, are not able to do that at this particular stage for a diverse set of, of reasons. So many of the Balkan states, and now of course we have applicant states such as uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, uh, and Moldova. So that's basically the waiting room, right? And then the third uh, level is what could be called the European area. And in that European area, you basically have countries that do not want to join the European Union, but should be involved in say security cooperation or whichever form of cooperation we have. So these are countries like Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, of course, uh, the United Kingdom uh, as, as, as well. And, and my argument in this sort of, uh, you know, differentiation mode is that we should find institutional structures for these three levels to interact um, in, in the name of or in favor of European uh, security. So that basically means that, you know, they meet up once or twice a year on a top level, 
like we saw in Prague. And I think the next was in Chisinau. Uh, and then I forget where the third one is, but I think the fourth one is in London out of all places. So, so you know, this is, I, 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 I think this is a good way to go about it. Now, someone might say that, oh, Alex is just loose intergovernmental cooperation. Yes, perhaps, but I mean, I, I, I think there is a case to be made for that, that form as, as well. My fourth point is that, okay, you'll be asking, Alex, now you're being an EU nerd, you know, where is NATO in all of this? Well, of course, NATO is a big part of the European security structure because, you know, we have countries, EU countries or European countries that are NATO members. Uh, then we have those who uh, want to be NATO members, and then we have those who don't want to be NATO members. So the same kind of applies for this, but it's a softer way of bringing in, I think, you know, security cooperation uh, in, in, into the game. So the, the EPC is sort of the overarching point. Um, final two very random points uh, I wanted to make as a, as a fifth one. Don't you all find it a little bit paradoxical that the European peace facility is, is being used specifically for military needs? Uh, and, and I mean, it, I, I, I don't mind it happening. I, I think it's fine and it's good, but, but th there is a certain paradox in that. Uh, and I'm sure uh, will be, you know, the source of ample uh, analysis and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and then the second random comment I wanted to make is on Zeitenwende, which you, you mentioned, uh, the sort of reversal of, of German uh, security and defense political culture. I, I, I think, you know, it's Zeitenwende, yes, but as you can see, it's more of a Zeitenslalom, right? So, you know, Germany is going left and right and back and forward and in all kinds of different directions. And the reason for that is simple because it, it is a fundamental change in the security culture of a country at the heart of Europe. Uh, and, and, and that's why I think we should have patience with Germany and understand that it's not an easy thing to do. I say this because the opposite example of that is, is Finland and I guess Sweden, but especially Finland. We were, for us, you could call it the Zeitenwende because we're joining NATO, but really it wasn't. It's because it's not a change in culture. We, we just join an institution to which we were so close that, you know, we are more NATO compatible than, than most NATO member states. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's part of this thing. I think what we need to discuss, and I'll finish off with this, Nicoletta, I think what we need to discuss is that, okay, here is the EPC, um, the European security structure, but what do we do with Russia when they try to go back to becoming a normal state? And that is the big challenge. And when do we do that? So obviously we saw that the OSCE didn't work. Uh, and obviously we saw that what we did in the 1990s and trying to bring uh, Russia into the, the European security structure didn't work because their thinking is still, we are a big power uh, you know, they are imperialist, they're revisionist and the rest of it. And if European security is to be molded, it has to be molded in the image of Russia. And that, of course, for us is a sine qua non. So here are my um, first comments and uh, I'll be really interested to hear uh, the other comments coming in. And already now, apologies for having to leave at uh, 10 o'clock sharp your time. Thank you, Alex. Uh, very interesting first remarks. I agree with you that this is the fundamental question to answer and that the European political community can be a, a solution for the immediate reaction because it guarantees some kind of convergence among these 44 uh, countries in the reaction against the Russian aggression of Ukraine. But for the longer term, we need a more uh, um, structured strategy. And Connecting this to also to the research of our project, you have already uh, correctly mentioned uh, various levels of differentiation within the project of the European uh, political community. We could also identify another form of differentiation in terms of uh, aggregation of different uh, countries on specific projects, because there is also this question mark for the future of the EPC, what kind of pragmatic solutions and concrete 
initiatives this project would like to bring to the uh, European community and what role the European Union institutions should play in all of this. But we will uh, come back to this also later on in the debate. Um, you also mentioned the posture of specific countries within the European Union, and this is something I would like to uh, discuss with uh, Mara, Maria Giulia Madio, who is the, our next speaker, uh, in terms of uh, the future prospects, in terms of uh, integration and differentiation within the European Union, uh, taking into, into account this watershed moment that we have witnessed within the European Union, and also the comeback of US and NATO as a, a strategic player in the uh, European defense architecture. Thank you very much, Nicoletta. Uh, thanks to Alex Stoop for, um, for the great uh, initial comments. Um, I think that in order to be able to make uh, reasonable predictions, we obviously need to first take stock of what has happened so far, and particularly of the EU response to the, uh, to the war in Ukraine so far. And indeed, there have been um, uh, lots of uh, instruments, new instruments, a proliferation, I would say, of institutional initiatives. Um, however, I do also believe that in terms of integration, we have not witnessed a change, a relevant change until now. Uh, rather than having a, an increase of integration uh, conceptualized, I would say, of, of, uh, as an increase of, of, of uh, supranational integration, we actually had an increase, as I said yesterday, of intergovernmental policy coordination and indeed of, uh, of differentiation, of policy differentiation, to be more precise. Um, and this is actually not a surprise, as uh, the foreign and security policy sector is a, an intergovernmental sector uh, that uh, essentially finds its root in the the, uh, in the key functions of state sovereignty. It is a core state power, as Kanchal and Yachten folks would say. And uh, the, the core state powers inherently are marked by a tension between member states' willingness to, uh, I would say, act collectively in principle vis-a-vis -vis complex, complex challenges and, and their reluctance to actually devolve uh, their sovereignty to Brussels. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, the issue of integration. As I said, there have been uh, uh, various instruments being launched, uh, various uh, initiatives. The EU also increased the capacity, the funding, the vault uh, to defend spending. Uh, however, um, uh, on the one hand, we did have a preeminence, as I said, of intergovernmental practices. Uh, and this is clearly reflected in the role that the European Council played in the response to the, uh, the war in Ukraine, including by uh, committing to bolster the EU capabilities in security and defense. And this certainly speaks, as I said, in favor of, a, of the occurrence of intergovernmental practices, of consensus seeking practices, but certainly not in favor of an increase of integration uh, in terms of uh, supranational, supranationalism. Um, in practice, uh, the EU also launched the Peace Facility Instrument, which was welcomed as an unprecedented move, uh, and some also consider it as a, as a reflection of a further integration of the security and defense sector. Uh, but this is, uh, to me, another example of intergovernmental policy coordination. The Peace Facility Instrument uh, consists of funds provided by the member states on a yearly basis based on their GDP, uh, it is directed and acts under the authority of a committee represent, uh, consisting of member states' representatives, and also ultimately the, 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 the responsibility for actually providing the, the military aid to Ukraine lies on the member states themselves. So overall, in this instrument, which certainly is unprecedented, um, the, the European Commission actually is only an operative branch of the member states. Um, regarding differentiation, um, now, obviously, we did not expect uh, a, uh, an occurrence of differentiation in, in, in terms of opt-outs, really based opt-outs opt -outs happening at times of war. Uh, and actually, what we witness instead is a de-differentiation, as Professor Shimmelfan rightly said yesterday. Uh, but in my opinion, we also um, witnessed the occurrence of policy differentiation. Um, which actually did not occur formally, meaning that we did not activate the, the treaty-based mechanisms for member states to actually cooperate uh, uh, on a flexible, uh, in a flexible manner, meaning, for instance, the execution of a, of a task by a group of member states or the enhanced cooperation. Uh, what we had instead um, was a group of member states composed of, um, consisting of France, Germany, and Italy, headed obviously by the French President Macron, steering the initial response uh, of the EU to, uh, to, the Ukraine, to the war in Ukraine, not necessarily with a mandate 
uh, from the other member states, a formal mandate for the other member states and EU institutions, um, uh, which clearly can create a problem of coordination and also accountability, in my opinion. Um, also, a lot has certainly happened at the level of member states. Member states increase their, uh, their spending in terms of defense. Uh, there are some member states that are um, about to reach the, uh, the two percent of the GDP in terms of defense spending uh, requested by NATO. Others will probably um, uh, go beyond that, probably uh, Poland. Uh, but nonetheless, this increase of defense spending and also the military aid provided to Ukraine has not uh, been coordinated at the EU level. There's no coordination whatsoever, which means that this is likely to lead to further policy differentiation and also potentially uh, fragmentation. So let me jump to the conclusion and also the prospects. Now, against this backdrop, what happened is that essentially the EU uh, response, and also I would say the EU strategic autonomy, has been absorbed by NATO. So uh, there was an increase of, uh, of forces at the eastern flank, but that occurred through NATO, not through the European Union. Um, and also the US has shifted its, its attention from the five to Asia uh, to back to Europe, I would say. Uh, but this is something that it's not strategic um, for the European Union to rely on in the medium to long term. Given the tensions between uh, Washington and Beijing, we might see a renew attention of the US towards East, uh, and also this uh, relative agreement, relatively high agreement in the EU among the member states, it's likely to decrease in the future. So two, two prospects here say that uh, the war ends, uh, as uh, Professor Stubb said, then there will be the problem of how to deal with Russia, and probably there will be divisions among the member states. So say that the war uh, does not end or becomes just frozen, here again, we're likely to see less agreement among the member states, which means that in an intergovernmental sector, we will see again intergovernmental policy coordination to the best or uh, differentiation, which inherently are short-term short -term solutions, given that they are, con they are vulnerable um, uh, and uh, vulnerable to the contingent preferences of the member states. And then, as I said, they also create a problem of legitimacy for the activities in international politics, as there are no accountability mechanisms in place to check what, they actually, uh, what actually is happening in, in that regard. So with this, I conclude, and uh, I'm happy to discuss later on uh, these topics with you. Thank you, Maria Giulia, and uh, um, for your first uh, assessment and uh, for focusing on these uh, prospects of possible uh, divergence of even fragmentation uh, within the European Union in a strategic terms. So we will come back to this also in the uh, Q&A. I would like to turn now to Professor Batora, uh, because, I mean, the um, war in Ukraine, it is just one of the latest examples of the um, of the uh, new forms, uh, new organizational forms uh, in uh, uh, hybrid warfare, which combines not only states but also private sector and uh, civil society. So we would like to hear from you uh, what kind of uh, modes and also differentiation dynamics we can witness in this uh, respect specifically, and also what can be the impact on the EU security architecture. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much in, uh, for, uh, for the invitation and also for the, for the first two speakers and uh, for the uh, introduction and painting the big picture. I want to drill a little bit down into some of the nitty gritty of the organizational change that we are experiencing in terms of how states organize for this new environment in, uh, in warfare. Now, in general, wars, and they offer always opportunities for innovation. That's not a new idea. Uh, but of course, non-wars also offer such opportunities, maybe even more so. Um, because non-wars, that is uh, organizing um, coercive statecraft uh, with the aim of uh, promoting political goals via various kinds of non-military means, combining uh, cyber attacks, information warfare, economic pressure, and law enforcement, non-wars uh, are also very much what is, what is being used to, um, uh, to promote states' goals uh, in recent decades. Now, Russia's attack on Ukraine, uh, this, of course started as a non-war of sorts in 2014, undermining Ukraine's statehood and then escalated into fully fledged warfare uh, this year. But it remains a kind of a gray zone because the Russians have not declared war. And what they have done is they keep calling it critically as a uh, special military operation. 
It is a combination of diplomatic resources, military resources, uh, intelligence resources, ethnic separatist groups, as well as quasi-state governments that work together with the Russian military to undermine Ukraine's sovereignty. Um, of course, Ukraine's response has also been as a kind of a combination of resources. Uh, there you see military resources, as well as private contractors, NGOs, citizen activists working together to defend Ukraine. This is part of a broader transformation trend where of course we see uh, various kinds of global terrorism, cyber attacks, cyber crime, artificial intelligence, and, the, and, and, and various reliance of, uh, of armed forces on that. So states have tried to shift and adapt their capabilities to this shifting way of waging war, combining warfare with non-war uh, instruments and gray zones. Now, this is not an entirely new development. If we look back in history, in the 17th century, the Dutch or the English East India companies, these were private companies which were promoting the interests of their state as private companies. They would be what Powell and Sandholz would call am amphibious entrepreneurs, shifting in their roles between the domains of statecraft and statehood and the domains of the private enterprise, using private enterprise tactics and rules to promote state goals. Um, so that's not an entirely new thing. What is relatively new is, of course, the, uh, the, our surprise by that. Historically, uh, the combination of private resources and state resources, public resources, as well as civil society, that has been the norm rather than the exception. Now, there's literature in the international political sociology that's trying to look at this in recent decades. You know, there's, uh, there's the concept of security assemblages, there's the concept of bricolage or enmeshment, uh, where, you see, where you have various scholars looking at how the private sector and states combine in delivering security policy. Now, we do see those kinds of developments, of course, in this current conflict. One way to think about these new organizational combinations is to think about them as interstitial organizations. That is organizations tapping into resources from multiple institutional domains and recombining those resources to deliver policies in a new way. Um, one of the examples you can find in the conflict, in the current conflict that's going on, is the Ukrainian air reconnaissance unit. It's called Aero Rozvitka. Um, that is a, an NGO that started as an NGO of IT enthusiasts in 2014, and they started to build drones. And those drones are now being used in combat against the Russian troops. So this is an NGO uh, using 3D printers to adapt grenades that they then drop on Russian forces and their defensive positions. Now, they get those drones delivered by a, by the 3D printers, they get delivered by a Czech company, and, uh, and they, these drones are relatively cheap, as well as the grenades. So they keep on degrading Russian military capabilities in a very new way, but again, I underline that this is an NGO. The link to the Ukrainian state is via several members of that NGO being members of the intelligence services of Ukraine. So what you have there is a relatively new uh, uh, organization, an interstitial organization, an NGO working also as part of the state and delivering defense policy in a completely new way. By the way, this particular unit was very much uh, the unit that has stood for stopping the Russian offensive on Kiev in the end of March. They stopped the major column, the 60 kilometers long column uh, that was approaching Kiev. So that's, that's one example of an interstitial organization and a new way of delivering defense policy with the help of an NGO and the uh, intelligence services as well as an assemblage of technology delivered by private companies. And of course, the, the reason why they operate is Starlink, obviously. So this is a combination of resources. Another example, which is pretty well known, and I'm sure all of you have read about it, is of course the Russian private military company Wagner Group. Um, and that is indeed um, a company that has fought on the battle lines, battlefields around the world. The, Russians, the Russian state has been using that company since 2014 in Ukraine, in Syria, in the Central African Republic, Libya. There are thousands of Russian contractors deployed into conflict. They're highly trained, deliver security policy in a very professional way. 
At the same time, the paradoxical aspect is, of course, that this organization is illegal in Russia. Russia does not allow for private military companies to exist. So the Russian constitution, this is un in a non-constitutional structure uh, that, that you see there. And, and of course, now they have been forthcoming with you know, being more public about themselves, about their activities, because of course they could no longer hide it uh, in recent months. And indeed, there has been some kind of a mutation of the Wagner Group into what they claim now is a technology organization. So they've opened up a headquarters in St. Petersburg. So they're trying to be act like they are a legit actor. But again, this is an interstitial organization. Again, this is not part of something new. This is not new that this has been a trend since the 1990s, in particular with outsourcing and privatization of warfare. Uh, the United States has been at the forefront of this development, as well as the UK later on. But at the same time, in the Western countries, you have had a lot of regulation introduced. Um, and there is indeed these companies in the US or the UK are legal. They pay taxes. They're on the stock market, not in the Russian case. right? Um, of course, what this allows for is plausible deniability in the case of the Russians. And there are reports, and these are corroborated, corroborated reports, that they were involved in some of the worst massacres of this war so far. Bucha is one of them, Irpin, another one. And of course, you could name a few others. So the Russian military keeps on outsourcing some of the worst massacres to these kinds of organizations. Now, the challenge, of course, is that this is a geopolitical challenge for the European Union as well. It has geopolitical aspects. Because if you have noted that, in July this year, the European Union has decided to wrap up, wrap up its mission in Mali. The reason for it was that the Wagner Group was hired by the Mali authorities, by the junta in Mali, to fight against Islamic terrorists. So the European Union simply said, well, we are wrapping up this mission because we are no longer going to work shoulder to shoulder with the, with the private uh, contractor from Russia, that is the Wagner Group. Um, the EU has had its own response to these shifts uh, for quite a long time. This is not a surprising development for the EU. In fact, the European Union, if you look at the numbers and the number of tenders, I've looked at the database, from 2014 till today, there has been an 80% increase in, in contracting. There are tens of thousands of contracts um, in the European Union in the defense and security realm. Now, of course, we could be talking about logistics, we could be talking about catering, but indeed we do talk about uh, security services like cl close protection detail for embassies. The European Union has been using contractors readily as well to protect its missions, such as, for instance, the European Union border assistance mission in Mali has been using two companies, one from Sweden with the Vespa Group and another one from France, GEOS. Um, so there are 150 officials uh, from the EU working to, uh, to, you know, to support the Libyan authorities in uh, border management. And then there are 60 private guards uh, deployed by private companies um, to uh, protect them. So I think these developments, if we, if we look at that, the rise of these interstitial organizations, um, that raises a number of questions and there are three and I'll end with those three questions for us as scholars. First, of course, it raises a question about the nature of sovereignty of the state as a key unit of political organization. Because indeed, this combination of state resources, private resources, and non-governmental or civil society resources, that raises the question of how exactly are state defense and security functions delivered? And indeed, how is the state as an actor changing if it is now becoming a combination of actors across the private and private sector and the civil society. The second question, obviously, are the implications of these processes for democratic scrutiny as well as accountability, right? How do we make sure that uh, we have institutionalized parliamentary procedures that encompass the private sector as well as uh, civil society actors? And third, we need to understand how these changes impact the established global order resting on the notion of modern sovereign state as the main constitutive element. So these kinds of organizational mutations where on the fringes of the state, you're getting connections across into the domain of the private sector and the civil society. What is that doing to the global order? Now, again, we shouldn't be, this is not surprising. We have seen that before. It's just a question about the current nature of the state order, which is built around 
uh, modern territorial sovereign states. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, shedding light on this specific aspect of uh, contemporary warfare or non-war. Uh, as you say, this is not a new phenomenon, uh, but it is true that it's taking new forms and uh, both uh, states and new institutions should take this in, uh, into account. It can be also <clears throat> uh, interpreted as a form of uh, uh, multi-level or vertical uh, coordination or uh, uh, differentiation in terms of uh, um, um, what the European Union is doing in security and defense. Um, in terms of accountability, there have been developments as you have probably followed recently um, in the European Parliament, the stance that was taken to uh, enlist uh, Wagner as uh, a terrorist organization and uh, uh, the um, resolution that was adopted uh, to consider Russia as a, a state sponsor of terrorism. But I agree, this is, uh, I mean, there is a long way to, um, uh, to regulate and uh, take stock of these new developments. Now I will uh, open the floor uh, for a discussion. I will uh, collect the first uh, reactions and questions, both from the uh, from the room, but also online. So people that are following us online that would like to intervene, just raise your virtual hands. I will make sure to uh, give you the floor. Uh, but first I look at the uh, people in the room to see who would like to break the highs this morning. Birgit, please. Thank you, and, and thank all three of you for a very interesting and, and complimentary um, uh, discussion. Uh, Marie, Yulia, if I may start with you and push you a little on uh, your conceptualization of integration. It seems to me that anything that is not the traditional community method, as in, uh, is defined by you as non, not integration. And I think we're long past the time when we need to, to regard the binary intergovernmental supranational uh, divide in the EU, because the reality is that it's the collective capacity of both, of all of those institutions. And I think one of the uh, important step changes in integration, I would say from somewhere the last five to six years, is that what we're seeing is that the Lisbon institutions are working and working differently. And there's much, much tighter engagement across those institutions today. And I would say that the interinstitutional cooperation, for example, on Brexit was exemplary. But I've also started to look at uh, how the ES, the Commission, uh, the GAC, relations with NATO are working on Ukraine. And it's the same thing. It's the intensity of engagement. Uh, and for example, on the sanctions package, it was the commission did all of the homework on the sanctions. So I think we need to be careful that we don't dismiss what's happening uh, because the, it's that intensity of engagement. And I would say on uh, the European Council, it's not just the formal meetings of the European Council, but that the multiple bilateralism across the heads of government and also the role of, and, and there's virtually no work done on, on the role of the Sherpas, but though, though they're in constant contact with each other all of the time. So I would say that we need to pay a bit more attention to the collective engagement of the system rather than uh, that binary, that old debate between intergovernmental and supranational, but just to, to your, your reaction to that. And then, Joseph, on that whole area of statehood, and Alex said that, that uh, and rightly, that Russia will be isolated and the what to do about Russia will really matter. But my question is, what kind of Russia will we have? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think given the uh, underperformance of the Russian military, there's a very real danger that that state loses control of coercive capacity and that groups like the Wagner Group become much more powerful internally in Russia, regardless of whether, uh, regardless of whether they are um, legal or illegal. So that the danger for, for, for Europe is not just uh, an isolated Russia, but a vast failed state. 
and, and, and that loss of coercive uh, power. And then a, a, a second question, is there any danger that that privatization part of the security complex is a threat to statehood in, in, the, in the rest of Europe? Thank you, Birgit. Mm, maybe I will ask the uh, speakers to reply immediately, um, if you want. Uh, so, Maria Giulia, please. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much. Indeed, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, we should not be, let's say, uh, entangled into this dichotomy between a supranational integration or intergovernmental integration. It's just that I believe that in relative terms, we have not seen a change compared to what happened in previous crises, meaning that there was uh, indeed uh, an engagement, a collective engagement, which led to unprecedented moves, such as, for instance, the provision of military aid to Ukraine. But still, that engagement came from the member states, as you rightly said, and particularly the European Council. Um, which means to me that uh, 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 there are dangers inter inherent to the functioning of the European Union. First of all, the fact that this is um, uh, going to be and is, and is actually a short term response of the European Union, because the moment that some member states uh, are going not to be on board anymore, then that could lead potentially to stalemates. Uh, also, uh, the preeminence of the uh, European Council over the whole functioning of the EU decision-making systems, to me, uh, is, uh, is potentially a pathology give of the system itself, given that uh, there are no accountability mechanisms to check what is happening actually in the European Council itself. So indeed, we should not be entrapped into a uh, dichotomy between uh, supranationalism and, uh, and intergovernmentalism or new intergo or a third category, which could be new intergovernmentalism. Uh, but still, on the one hand, in relative terms, there has not been, to me, at least is a, a major terms in terms of integration of the system itself. Uh, and also in the short, in the medium to long term, this is not likely to lead to a smoother and more effective and certainly not legitimate uh, functioning of the EU uh, governance. So I hope I responded to your question. Joseph. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and, and Bridget, you're, you're pointing to something which is absolutely a key question for, for development and for security in Europe is exactly what you're, what you're pointing to, which is, um, you know, as Russia is failing, and obviously they are failing. I mean, this is a major failure so far, um, luckily. Um, at the same time, we need to ask this question that you just raised, what will happen to Russia? How will it, how will it cope with that failure? And of course, the, the, uh, we, we do not really know <laughs> where this is going to go. It's not clear. Um, but one of the possible scenarios is that some kind of a group, um, I mean, a, revolu a large scale revolution is not quite likely. I don't think that that's going to happen. But I mean, um, there are others who are way more well versed in thinking about Russia and have Russian expertise. But the, the scenario that you pointed to, which is a coherent, well armed, well organized group like the Wagner group, trying to you know, institute some kind of a coup d'etat um, might be one of the scenarios, which should be a very scary scenario. Um, because in this case, obviously, Russia is a major nuclear power. Um, they have all kinds of other capabilities. Um, so I guess what we uh, might be seeing is some kind of a mutation of the Russian state into something quite neo-medieval. The way they already operate now is, you know, reminds you of the 30 years war uh, in Ukraine, right? I mean, this is about killing civilians. This is about not respecting any sort of uh, rules of war. Um, this is about targeting civilian infrastructure and then indeed using mercenary groups to kill civilians. So that's something that's very, uh, very, you know, medieval. And we might be seeing a neo-medieval version of Russia, which could be quite scary. So I think Europe should be getting ready for this, um, for this very negative scenario. Uh, and there are only negative scenarios, by the way. I don't see any positive one. Uh, and then the second question you're asking, I think is absolutely also uh, super relevant uh, in relation to the regulation of private military forces in Europe. And of course, the member states of the European Union, as ever, as, as always, have a patchwork of regulation. There is no common regulation in the EU for the uses of private military companies. So it really depends on how the member states actually decide to regulate. So there are various models. The German model, more or less, more broadly, would be we don't use military, private military companies at all. There was a discussion in the Bundestag in 2005 where some of the MPs raised the question to the Minister of Defense, 
how is Germany going to cope with you know, the uses of private military companies? How do we regulate? And the response of the German federal government was, we don't use them. We simply will not. So there's a way of saying, you know, putting your head in the sand and saying, well, this doesn't exist for us. But the reality is, of course, German forces operate in military operations around the world alongside private contractors from other countries. They have to work with EU institutions which use private contractors to protect their premises and so on. So the German model is, you know, kind of a denial. There is also a um, more radical model in Europe, which is the UK. They have super liberal uh, regulation almost no regulation whatsoever. Most of the private military companies in Europe actually operate out of the UK. And so we do see quite a few European missions actually using British-based companies um, in their operations in various, various capacities. And then you have a kind of a middle ground model, which I would, you know, this is a Swedish model, where the Swedes have uh, had a liberal approach to this, but at the same time have been actually co-opting these private companies. There is a company in Sweden called the, the, the Vesper Group, which has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Swedish government, with the defense department, with the defense ministry, of you know, collaborating around, around uh, military missions. So you can have Swedish defense personnel serving for a year or two in the private company and then coming back to the military or intelligence, right? So this is, again, a kind of an interesting combination where, of course, given the fact that they have a memorandum of understanding with the Swedish government and the Swedish defense establishment, they have to follow certain rules and norms. So this co-optation, I argue, I just wrote an article on this. Um, it's not out yet, but it's on the way, hopefully somewhere. Uh, it's I, I argue in that article that, the, um, uh, that there is a, a rise of something I, I call uh, national defense, defense entrepreneurial firms, which is in between those classical private military companies, which are to, totally open to any kind of bidder and any kind of customer, which are actually working for governments um, in, uh, in the Swedish case would be, would be instructive. So we do not have joint regulations in Europe. I think this is an issue, of course. The European Parliament has had a report in 2011. Since then, not much has happened. I think this is right now on the agenda. We should be introducing EU-wide regulations uh, if we are going to go forward, because, of course, it's a danger to um, you know, the, the monopoly the on, the, on the legitimate use of violence of, of states in Europe, of course. So I have, a, I have a number of requests for the floor. Uh, since Alex has to leave us at 10, uh, are there specific questions addressed to him or us? Yes. So Alina, please. Okay. Yeah, this works. All right. Uh, so, uh, well, it was actually uh, mentioned by several speakers, but uh, Alex mentioned it, uh, and I uh, kind of have his <laughs> quote here. So my question will be about the uh, isolation of Russia, like uh, as you mentioned several times, that uh, the R Russian state has to be isolated for some time until, I quote, it's going to sort it out or it comes back to a normal state. So this is a very interesting uh, definition, I would say, or the, uh, that what do you mean uh, and what we should consider as coming back to a normal state? Would it be ending the war or would it be changing the um, governmental authorities? So what would be uh, considered as a comeback to a normal state? Thanks. Thank you. And uh, John Eric, please. Okay, thanks. Yes, um, yes, I'm, I'm interested in the different groups of states and, and would like to focus on one region that where Alexander Stubb is the most relevant uh, representative from, namely the Arctic. Um, and this is an issue I think that seems to me to be somewhat going under the radar in some of this, because there is an interesting development in Russia in this. In 2014, when Russia took over Crimea, it was still negotiating agreements in the Arctic. And it's actually still doing some of these fisheries agreements and so on. So in those days, it was bifurcated. It was a, a rogue state in, in Crimea, but it was actually a law-abiding state in the Arctic. I don't think that is any longer the case. I think there is a militarization of the Arctic. And being a Norwegian uh, with sovereignty of uh, Svalbard, with also massive resources and ecological issues and so on, I find this extremely disturbing. And with, with the um, Murmansk Peninsula, where the main Russian base is, um, and also again in the vicinity of the Arctic. So I would urge the Europeans to, to place emphasis on the Arctic, and I'd like to ask Alexander what he thinks about this and uh, 
and what possible uh, avenues there are for the European Union, because the, the problem for the European Union is that it's basically there through proxy, because the member states of the European Union are in the, on the Arctic Council. The European Union has sort of a observer status, but it's not really directly involved. So it's sort of, it's a more tricky situation for itself, and yet this is a region that has fundamental importance. And of course, also, is a very important part, uh, area for the British. So another possibility of collaboration and so on. So thanks. Thank you. Alex, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, a lot of good comments and uh, observations. If, if I take, this is probably going to have to be my last answer, so I'll, I'll just dissect the two questions and then give one final general remark. Um, on, on Alina's question about Russian isolation, I mean, what would be the tipping point when we consider Russia to be back uh, into the realm of a normal state. I, I think a good starting point uh, is uh, that it sticks to international law, rules and procedures. So that's basically looking at things through the lens of uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe about territorial sovereignty and um, integrity. It's about abiding to the basic rules and principles in uh, managing states uh, on the basis of uh, UN charters. I, you know, we have to take a slightly legalistic approach. That's you know, point number one. The second one is the political one. Do we need regime change? I, I, I would argue yes, but that will probably have to happen from inside rather than um, from uh, the, the, the outside, but it, it's going to be a very difficult you know, path back to some kind of normal relations because I think on one hand, never underestimate sort of Russian suspicion. Um, you know, it, it, the culture is, is, is very strongly about, you know, someone is out there to get me or, or zero some game and don't at the same time underestimate, you know, our to a certain extent, reluctancy to go back to a normal situation because we basically failed in, in you know, whether you want to call it Ostpolitik or, or whether you want to call it, you know, Handel durch Wandel or, or, or Wandel durch Handel or, or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, it, it's going to be a really difficult build back up of, of trust. It would be very good, of course, to find some kind of a common place or space to do this. But what, it, what that will eventually be, I, I don't know. Then John Eric on, on the Arctic Council. I mean, you know, I, I do have fairly good memories from the Arctic Council, especially when I was Minister for Foreign Affairs. I actually visited Murmansk that you, you mentioned and, and participated in a few uh, Arctic Council meetings. I always found that the strength of that was that we had the United States, or obviously Canada, as well, but Russia, the same table about a strategically important area. And I agree with you that we might be sort of letting it go a little bit too much under the radar. But I do remember at the time, actually, you know, South Korea, China and others asking for uh, observer status and, and trying to sort of, you know, also tell my colleagues in the European Union how important it was. And there have been Arctic reports, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do we want to be in a situation whereby we have an Arctic Council with the EU represented, Russia and the US? I, I don't know, perhaps in the future, um, but, but I don't think the time is for that now. But again, a good way of bringing the UK into the system as well. I actually think the Arctic is, is you know, it, it, it's about military, it's about climate, it's about resources, it's about energy, it's about the economy. Uh, and, and, and obviously strategy as well, whether it's waterways uh, up through the north or, or whatever it might be. Then um, two final points I, I wanted to make to the conversation. There, there's, I, I think it's been a super interesting conversation and I, I, I've been listening to, I, I think, excellent presentations by Maria Julia and, and, and Josef. There, there's one thing that I always you know, want to stress when we have these kinds of conversations. And I, I say this as a, you know, former practitioner, current wannabe academic. I think it's very important that if we want to have true impact, you know, in, in conversations like this, that we use the, the, the sometimes a little bit more the language of policymakers, if you know what I'm saying. 
because if you go too far away into you know the the realm of 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 theory or or scholarly conversation then we're just talking amongst ourselves and i i, I think a lot of the ideas that i'm getting out of the conversation are, are super important i need to be communicated in a way in which a lot of policymaker under policymakers understand it i mean i've been trying to come i'll give an example i've been trying to come to terms with the wagner group and the way in which you know joseph and others were talking now I sort of went, okay, yeah, this is how it works. And, and of course I live, you know, I'm, just to show you Arctic and others, this is my back, back, backdrop right now. So, you know, I, I live in a country with 1,340 kilometers of, of border with Russia. So you, you'll understand that if Russia is isolated, it's dangerous. If Russia loses its capacity to monopolize coercive power, even though we don't like the way in which it's using it, it's dangerous. If it goes into the hands of someone else, it's dangerous. So I am sure that right now, Finnish government and other authorities are looking at, at different scenarios. Um, a final point I wanted to make is that when we look at these scenarios, remember that obviously military is not the only one because it, I, I, you know, I, I do believe that right now the line between war and peace has been blurred, right? So, so you know, we can use energy. We, uh, there's so many weapons we can use. We can use energy, currency, information, technology, and then of course, you know, hard power like, like the Wagner Group and, and others are, are using. So I, I do believe um, sort of in Mark Leonard's thesis that we live in an age of unpeace. Now it's just a question of how do we get out of there? And a final point as an EU scholar that has, you know, basically tried to walk in the footsteps of, 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 of Bridget, I fully agree with her that right now we live in, a, in, 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 you know, we don't live in this binary you know, community, intergovernmental, or then federal, whatever you want to call it, world that, that, you know, we live in a very messy world, a very disorderly world. And I think that's manifested in the way in which the European Union decides on things as well. Um, a final point, I'm much more optimistic than, than Josef. I, I, you know, out of disorder, at the end of the day comes order. And we in the West have to understand that things are changing. And eventually we will rectify things. And that's what I wanted to say as my final word. And, and sorry, I have to leave. Thank you, Alex. First, for this uh, note of optimism and also for uh, reminding us on the importance of this balance and uh, constant relationship between academia and policy, which is also one of the challenge, also the main objectives of projects such as DICE and also one of the objective of conferences like this in which we'll try to translate the results of our uh, research into something that is appealing for policymakers and uh, something that can be translated into practice. So thank you very much. And um, we will have further opportunities to discuss on these topics. Thank you. I will continue with uh, our conversation. I have first uh, uh, Johannes, and then I will follow. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the great presentations. Uh, I was just wondering a little bit, just a couple of remarks or questions, Mix, take it as, as, you, as you see fit. The first one is, I'm picking up on something Bridget has said, the underperformance of the Russian military. But what we also must not forget is the underperformance of the Russian economy in the last decades. So, and for me, the big question always is what role will China play in a post-Putin era? And that some, somehow is one elephant in the room. And there are lots of those elephants in the room, I have to say. Second elephant for me is by, by virtue of marriage and institution, I'm half American. And when you talk to people in Washington, well, how can I say it? The, the happiness about Europe's contribution to keep the Russians at bay is limited at best. And it's easily to follow that when you look at the resources that have been, been used in support of the, of the Ukraine. Yeah? So I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're not once again falling in the trap of total institutional navel gazing at the European Union. Yeah? Something is gonna come out of it. It's great what we're doing. It's fascinating what we have achieved. Let's not forget how many different interests and in states there are. But in the end, 
what Alex has also said, there will be a new order, but what role will Europe play in this order? And I'm a bit more pessimistic than Alex. Um, I think we will not play a big role in there. Last remark to Josef about the Wagner Group. You know, I think we all agree that the only thing more despicable than Mr. Putin is Mr. Prigozhin uh, from the Wagner Group. But there have been credible reports that they have tremendous problem recruiting mercenaries in this group. So that is not gonna be a threat to the enormous Russian security apparatus. You know, that, so this, this coup from within, the change from within, I don't think it's gonna happen like that. That can, if at all, only happen if the oligarchs keep losing money day after day after day in the European sanctions. Thank you. Thank you, and Olena. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, agree with Joseph in his uh, pessimistic view about the future. Uh, and uh, my comment will be also about the Wagner Group and its role as um, its growing role um, in in Russia. And uh, and uh, I would say that um, it cannot be like uh, it seemed to me that you have compared it as a as a like a NGO uh, aligned with the state. But uh, the last case with uh, the public execution with a sledgehammer of, uh, of one of the members of Wagner Group and then the reaction of Russian state officials, like it's not our business, shows that it's something else. It's not an institution, it's not a, like a non-governmental organization or mercenary group that is aligned with the state. It's something else. It's probably... Uh, it's um, maybe it's some somehow substitute this some uh, state institutions already in Russia. So um, my point is that we are now seeing, we are now observing the transformance transformation of Russia in a fascist rock state where the role of Prigozhin, such, uh, especially Prigozhin and his allies is growing. And let's not forget that many, many members of Wagner groups, group are former Siloviki, former uh, um, servicemen of uh, state service, servicemen of, uh, of uh, Russia, FSB and uh, army, etc. So they recruit veterans. So they are also highly uh, connected to the state system. Uh, so um, also uh, what I noticed recently is that uh, the political influence of Prigozhin is rising, raising in Russia. And there were also infer there was also information about his ambitions to create some kind of political party. Uh, well, uh, so I wouldn't exclude um, uh, his uh, uh, inter intervention or joining the official uh, institutions of Russia. And uh, maybe somehow he can be observed at one point, he can be um, observed as their, as their um, future Russian leader. That's from some point. So it's a, it's a perspective, uh, what, what can be seen. And uh, he is, let's remember also with, about his strong alliance with Kadyrov. Uh, so from this point, uh, and yeah, and the last, the last also interesting, and he's, I would say that he's also a very good master of communication. He gives Russian society what Russian society likes very much at this point, this moment. And I, right now I speak about the recent case of this uh, information case with the, when the, the uh, lawyer, Prigozhin's lawyer, uh, gave a so-called representative of European Parliament the violent case with the sledgehammer in sight with the traces of blood on, on the handle. It was not um, directed on the Europeans because Europeans mostly didn't notice it, but it was directed on Russian society and yeah it was very well um taken by russians so this is my comment and i would uh, ask uh, what do you think about this what can be the reaction right now of uh, european union because it is a real threat 
Thanks. So we'll collect other, okay, free interventions. Very quick, please. And then I will go back to the speakers, please. Richard Rose, Schumann Center visitor. Um, to follow up on the point of Stubbs and Batora, that sovereign states have uh, elected governments. What policymakers can understand is that they have to carry the Italian electorate with them. From this point of view, the interesting thing is what the cost of supporting Ukraine is. It is contrast with Ukraine, which is also an accountable government to the Ukrainian people. It is not fighting, it's not troops, but it is energy. And I can see the uh, need to consider as we go through the winter that sovereign member states will have to explain that the cost of energy, whether it's shortages or insecurity or just money, is something we have to put up with. But the question is uh, where and to what extent the willingness of democratically elected governments in the EU will begin to uh, weaken in a desire for compromise. And here the tension is, um, and we need to put on the table what the Ukrainian government's minimum terms are, because uh, that will be quite, you can't deliver a solution without Kiev as well. Thanks. I'm Scott Radnitz, I'm a Jean Rene fellow. Um, one of the most surprising developments of the war, I think other than the Russian military's underperformance is the relative lack of importance of, uh, of cyber attacks, of, of um, cyber means as a weapon um, in military operations. Unlike the, uh, the attack on the European uh, Parliament website a couple of days ago, uh, right, we haven't really seen cyber being used in warfare, which confounds the expectations of most military analysts before the war started. So the question is, to what extent um, do we even know, um, has the European Union been involved in assisting Ukraine in order to preempt such attacks um, versus NATO, or to what extent um, um, right, is, have, have European militaries, European cyber experts been involved in this? Um, or does the credit belong to Ukrainians themselves for anticipating what Russia would have done? Um, and if the EU has been involved, to what extent then is this a model um, for, for future defensive um, operations in the cyber realm going forward? Thank you, last question. Thank you very much, Anna Sobchak. I'm the EU fellow, uh, seconded from the European Commission um, to be here on the fellowship of the Florence School of Regulation Robert Schumann Center. Um, I must say that those discussions for me uh, being very interesting yet quite emotional for me because in my, in my veins, I have a Polish blood, I have Ukrainian blood, I have Russian and some Tatar. And I was trained uh, educated in the West. And now I'm the EU civil servant uh, who has been very much actively involved uh, in the cooperation with Ukraine and also with Russia. So I also have seen quite a lot of developments that we are also discussing uh, today. And having said that, I have a question to, to you, to the, to the panelists um, about security and the role of this information, the fake news, because as you know, uh, Russia has been very actively involved for many years uh, in the, the disinformation and using fake news as a weapon as well. So also it had the impact of security and everything. And it's not only externally, but internally. And it a little bit reminds me of a, a famous novel by George Orwell, 1984. Uh, and that's the also situation currently in Russia we can uh, relate to. So that would be my question to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So, Josef, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, these are all uh, all great questions and uh, uh, quite a few of them. So I'll, I'll try to go uh, gradually. Um, so to Johannes, and as always, you have uh, <laughs> very tough questions. Um, so of course, the question about the, uh, the, the standing of the EU in the upcoming order um, is, is on the table, obviously. And um, as you say, China uh, is very much another con contender uh, for the for the not only the EU but for the liberal democracies of the West more generally. If you read the U.S. security strategy, the, the latest one uh, just published two, 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 three weeks ago, you will see that China uh, is a way more important challenge as seen from the United States than Russia at the moment, right? So, um, so that's, that's clearly a, uh, an issue. Uh, and it's also a question of how they actually wield their influence. And they've been trying to capitalize on this conflict between Russia and, and, uh, and the EU and the West more generally. Um, and trying to get their, um, you know, be, get, position themselves um, inside the EU. And it, it happens through the gray zones. It doesn't happen directly through military uh, means, but think about such things, and, and you know more about it than, than most of us, batteries for electric cars. So 30% of all batteries for electric cars are actually uh, Chinese, uh, China produced. They actually control the market, set the standards, and they've just invested in um, a new factory in Erfurt in Germany, 2 billion euros, just opened. They're opening another one in Hungary for 7 billion euros, right? So there's a lot of investment uh, by China. Now, what's the issue? Well, of course, we would think these are jobs, but this is not only about that. Obviously, this is about also the human rights standards that the Chinese companies, there's an entire, uh, an entire infrastructure of companies for mining nickel, uh, cobalt, and other kinds of um, uh, minerals in African countries without any regard for, um, for uh, human rights and uh, dignity of the workers. So Tesla cars, um, Mercedes cars, BMW cars, all of them use these batteries. So, I mean, this is the kind of influence that China, China is having and trying to promote. Uh, and so, of course, how do we counter that? Now there's, there's an, entire, an, an entire sector of, of thinking about countering this, this type of Chinese, uh, Chinese influence um, on the EU uh, in setting standards in the economy. So that's, that's one aspect. Coming back to this question of the Wagner Group. Um, now, obviously, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is indeed a, uh, a, a, a structure we actually don't know much about. The ownership structure of the Wagner Group is not clear, um, and I think there are various kinds of analyses. Um, but this is a conglomerate of companies. This is not just one company, but the companies provide they provide uh, catering to the Kremlin. This is why Prigozhin is called you know Putin's chef. Uh, this is the mainstay, as if you know the legal mainstay of what they do. But at the same time, they also uh, do do work in the area of. Um, of this information because he runs, he set up something called the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. So that goes you know, to that question of disinformation. Um, so that's something we need to still figure out. And I think, um, I think you're absolutely right that, there, that he might have political ambitions. Um, and the question is, how, does the, um, how, does this, these te how do these tensions play out in the Russian defense establishment or Russian security establishment more broadly. They have very good connections with the defense establishment, as you say. They recruit a lot of the special operatives from the reconnaissance units, from airborne units, and so on, after they you know, finish their careers there. But at the same time, there, is, there are tensions with other parts of the security um, establishment. So let's see how that plays out. And I'm, I really do hope that uh, the EU representatives, as well as the United States, speak with you know, some parts of the Russian security establishment more broadly, hopefully. Uh, and with the end of creating some kind of stability after this might crumble. Um, now, um, to Richard's question, what is the cost of supporting Ukraine? Um, that's how I understand your question. Of course, this is a major issue now, especially this winter in many um, you know, European Union member states. Maintaining public support for the rising costs and for the uh, costs of maintaining and supporting Ukraine. I mean, to keep Ukraine running costs about 5 billion euros a month, which is an enormous sum. 
and that of course goes from taxpayers' money uh, from the EU and other, uh, from, and of course from the United States as well. But I mean, that's, that's the issue, right? How do you explain to the citizens, how do you maintain the, um, the support for this? And I suppose, and, and so far it's been going well, but I mean, there are of course, uh, that we are, uh, we have very tough months ahead of us and um, uh, in terms of the energy crisis and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, this might be an issue in terms of, you know, maintaining such support. Um, and this will be the biggest challenge for one of the biggest challenges for EU member states politicians to actually, you know, maintain that kind of support. Cyber attacks, um, uh, are they not used? I'm, I'm very sure uh, that, uh, you know, the European Union uh, in general is experiencing about 5,000 ransomware attacks a day. So it's, it's happening. I am pretty sure the Russians and others are actually involved in wide scale attempts to undermine, um, you know, cybersecurity in Ukraine. But of course, there are countermeasures. And I'm, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, to speak to directly to what kind of measures those are. Uh, I can't tell you. I, don't, I just don't know that at the moment. Uh, but I'm, I'm very sure that this is, this is being done. Uh, Ukraine is being supported by, in particular, NATO member states. And then Anna Sobchak, fake news. Now, very quickly on that, I think this is absolutely, of course, a major challenge. Uh, fake news and, and uh, undermining democratic uh, undermining democratic debate in the member states of the European Union. This has been a goal for a lot of the Russian disinformation campaigns. Um, it is about the inability of a society to maintain what Habermas had called, and I will quote John Eric's uh, good friend, uh, Jürgen Habermas, Fakticität und Geltung, right? This is about the you know, undermining that ability of a society to have that. Because, I mean, the difference between the disinformation campaigns now and under the Cold War uh, is that in the Cold War, the Soviet propaganda was actually spreading a view of the Soviet system, and they had a certain agenda to, you know, in terms of setting up a good image of the Soviet communist regime. And, of course, promote the ideas of communism. This is not the case now, right? The Russian disinformation campaign and, and other disinformation campaigns of other actors has been built around the about that around undermining the ability of a society to tell the truth from what is the what is not the truth. Give you a, give you an example: Sputnik News, right? That's the, you know the news outlet that the Russian state has been funding. Look at that, right? I mean, what they do is ninety five percent of the news is correct, good information that can be corroborated, and then five percent is something that's totally made up, right? So what it does is basically you know putting forward narratives that eventually, of course, undermine this ability of, of telling the truth from the untruth. Now, I guess the way forward is, um, and it's as plain, as simple as that, invest in education. Look at Finland. Sputnik News had to shut down in Finland because the Finnish society just didn't react to it. Nobody was clicking on, on, on uh, Sputnik News. So instead of, uh, you know, um, of course, you could do, you have to do countermeasures in terms of uh, this, you know, countering this kind of disinformation, shutting down websites, and countries do that in the member states, of course, as in, you, know, you know that very well. But I mean, um, this is, uh, the, the issue, of course, is about investing into education systems where kids can have well-established basis for critical thinking. Uh, and I think that's the best resilience strategy. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Josef. I have a two-finger intervention by Johannes, but really one minute. <laughs> I think not, not even one minute, just the reaction to the question about cyber war. If you talk to the experts, for instance, at the IAEO in Vienna, they are working double, triple shifts around the clock because attacks have, have, have been rampant uh, since the Ukraine war started. So there is something going on major. It might not be directed directly to military infrastructure, but at other institutions. I happened to be in the US when Colonial shut down, the ransomware you mentioned. It was utter chaos in the east of the US. Yeah. So that, that, that is more to it than just being a means of direct warfare to that. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Maria Giulia. Thank you very much for the comments. I think Joseph pretty much covered it all. Um, what I can maybe add just um, 
to the to the issue of disinformation. I know that uh, after the 2013 2014 uh, uh, crisis uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, the US had established a Stratcom Union. You may know that way better than me. Uh, what is interesting uh, is that uh, a few years later they also established um, a countering information unit uh, specifically devoted to the Western Balkans. Um, and they have this website co uh, called EU versus Disinfo. I know they're still quite active in, in countering um, disinformation campaigns from Russia. And I also know that uh, there have been code of conducts uh, also um, elaborated for uh, online platforms, for instance, regarding fake, fake accounts. Uh, and this code of conduct, um, practice for code of conduct has been actually strengthened in 2022. So clearly there's an activism on the EU side that started uh, way, way before uh, February 2022, but that actually, uh, um, was uh, countering initiatives that already started before 2022, February 2022. And that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you, Josef, for covering all. Thank you. And on this, I uh, would like just to mention that we have just started a new Horizon project on the role of um, the educational systems in Europe to counter disinformation, which is called Reclaim, coordinated by the University of Iceland. So if you want to take a look at that for the future, it would be uh, great. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. We are a bit late, I'm sorry, uh, with the organizers. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers and the participants, and we will continue our conversation after the coffee break. Thank you.